What have you heard? Well, I heard. I I, I need to explain that the whole thing. To, like a, it's a story about a dog I was working with. Let's do very, it. Very, very, very yeah. difficult dog. Well, do you want to save it for the? Let's do it. Do it now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, before the recording. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. No. Well, it's all on, so let's go. Oh, we're going. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're live, Neil. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know what? I had gone to work with this little dog in uh, Newry, and the lady there had, well, she's still recovering from cancer, and her husband had a heart condition. And they were lovely people, lovely people. But at the end of the session, it was about two hours of working with her dog, I noticed all these little angel things all around the, the room and out in the garden. And I said to her, uh, I'm not being shaky here or anything, but what's all the angels about? Oh, son, she says, son, like... <laughs> And me, the AJM. But anyway, she says, oh, son, she says, do you not believe in your guardian angel? And I says, no, not really. Well, she says, you have a guardian. He's standing there behind you. And she says, see, the next time you're in trouble, you just say to your guardian angel, whatever God's will is for me, will you help me here? Mm. And you watch what happens. Right, whatever. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thank you. Three weeks later, I was working with this dog in a different part of New York. And it was a German Shepherd mixed with a Collie, and it couldn't be put on a lead. Hadn't been on a lead for three years. Put a lead near it, it went mental. And when I arrived, didn't the farmer man who owned the dog tie it to a garden chair? And the poor dog freaked, broke the leg off the chair, and away over the fields with it. So he eventually managed to get it and bring it back. And he says, here you are, and swore away and all. And he says, take the effing thing and see if you, what you could do with it. So I picked this dog up and walked it to the end of their drive, put it <coughs> down on the ground. I thought, right, I have 40 years working with dogs. I know I can sort this. Mm. So I am working away with this dog. It started to dig a hole in the tarmac. <laughs> it started to vomit. It peed itself. Then it came up the lead trying to bite me. And I thought, shit, I don't know what to do with this dog. And I remember this wee woman. So I thought, right, okay. And I said, well, if you're there, I need a hand because I don't know what to do here. And as clear as a bell, I heard in my left ear, I heard, stand still. Mm. That's all I heard. And I stopped everything, stood there motionless. And all of a sudden, this wee dog stopped trembling, stood quietly beside me, and I took a wee step. He took a, She took a wee step, another one, another one. 20 minutes later, wagging her tail, wow. walking beside me. Wow. All the way through... My five and a half years doing my PhD at Queen's, every time I came to an obstacle, I did exactly the same thing. I don't know what to do here. What's the answer? And within an hour, the answer would come. I've had more experiences that are even more stunning than that. But that was that was one of my most recent experiences. Wow. Wow. Yep. And, well, and, and you know, whether you believe in... God or the universe or whatever, if you hand over the fact that you're finite, you know, you we're all dependent in some way, mm. and you just say, look, I can't deal with this. Show me the way forward. Whatever you believe in will show you the way forward mm. if you throw it open to them. I love that. Epic. I love that. Hand over the fact that you're finite. I love that. Yes, yeah. I believe. And you're weak. We're all weak. Yeah, yeah. And we all need something else outside of ourselves. No one is an island, as they always say. Mm. And it's true. Mm. It's absolutely true. And the older I get, the more I become aware of that, how much we depend. And also the fact that, you know, it's like going down a stream. Life is like a stream or a river. And you meet these little eddies here and there. Mm these little bits of wood or whatever swirl around and these are actually people and they coincide with your life for mm -hmm. a brief period of time. You help each other mutually in one way or other and then you move on. I found that all the way through. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Mm. The ripples, yeah. Love it. Well, Neil, welcome to the show. Good to have you. <laughs> <laughs> That's Thank a good opener, much. I think. <laughs> <laughs> We've started. <laughs> Thank you. We're calling this series Wild Wisdom. Mm. I met Sai a couple of months ago. Sai, big Sai Kelly, good to see you, bro. Rocking the producer today, rocking the rocking co the chair. <laughs> yeah, making the, the multicam action work. And I'm really curious about your story. You know, you're the author of this great book, Search Dogs and Me. Uh, we'll definitely plug it a few times throughout the show. For anyone who hasn't read it or picked it up, definitely recommend that. Um, I really don't know how to describe you, right? I think we were kind of talking before, it's like dog trainer. We're like, 
dog trainer seems a bit weak for for the cv so we'll get into it but you know needs trained dogs for search and rescue drug detection disaster relief optical detection whatever that means we'll get into that later on he's traveled all around the world he's saved lives he's recovered Mm -hmm. bodies he's worked with all kinds of dogs in all sorts of places but i Mm want to start how did you guys meet because this is how neil's here how did you meet sir yeah i can't remember so i contacted you did you DM him? Did you, did you slide in? <laughs> I, I did. I did. I contacted. <clears throat> I contacted you because uh, how much of this story can I share very carefully? Why are um, all your stories classified? <laughs> <laughs> I meet some wonderful people. <laughs> so I, I'm on a plane uh, in the states. I'm on. I'm on a national flight um, where I am flying. I think I'm flying from. Uh, An undisclosed location. Undisclosed location. <laughs> as supposed to be. Um, and 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 we. I get up. Plane lands, I get up, grab my bags, and all of a sudden, there's a dog behind me. And the dog's wearing a red jacket. And I'm thinking, oh, crap, what's happening? What's going on? There's a dog on the plane. They found something they're doing. And, it just, and the guy just read me like a book. And he goes, calm down. He's been under your seat the entire time. Oh. oh. I was like, really? Yeah, this humongous. I, I can't even describe the dog for classification. <laughs> this big dog was under my seat the whole time. So I get talking to this guy because um, I love just talking to strangers, as you know. And I go down to uh, baggage handling with him, and we've talked the entire way. I'm hearing his life story and how amazing this guy is. And I'm like, I need, I need to film this guy. I need to get his story. I need to get details from this guy. He said, "You want to talk to somebody? You got to talk to Neil Powell." And I, and I was like, "Who's Neil Powell?" And he goes, "Well, Neil Powell had a big hand in what we've been able to do with this dog. I think it's the best way to put it." Mm-hmm. and uh, a very special dog and uh, I said right well wh- where is Neil Powell in the world and he's like well he's in Newcastle I said oh uh, England uh, yeah okay fair enough he's, no 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 <laughs> Newcastle uh, County down Northern Ireland and I was thinking that's like 20 minutes from my house who's this guy so that's when I thought right I've got to contact you so that's the beginning of our relationship and you'll find that I refer to Neil as young Neil yeah whenever you, you phoned him earlier I saw that yeah. young Neil what young, young, young Neil. Neil oh yeah yeah because throughout yeah. his book yeah throughout his book Neil is referred to he's talked to by other people in the book as well young Neil and so, <laughs> so that's why I was calling him young Neil um, were you always around people that were older than you? Uh, that's a very good question mm, yes I su- not really no no I don't suppose so no I wasn't really no why the young Neil? why were they all calling young Neil? You well I don't know I, I, I sort of <laughs> maybe give a, yeah a bit of a lunatic maybe and you know give this <laughs> people the idea that this guy needs a bit of guidance. I don't really know, but I was always called Young Neil by the, the doggy man. I suppose it's kind of a an indirect compliment in a sense that it's a term of you're a young student, like you're you're yeah. for me, you know. But young uh, Palawan vibes, isn't it? That's it, yeah. yeah. But like some of the guys that I've met in the dog world, well like there are three actually, uh, but have been fantastic guys. Like, you know, mm. I've learned an awful lot. Mm. I mean anything I've learned I've it's been passed on. Mm. You know. What can you tell us about the the ancient connection between man and dog? The ancient connection? Yeah. Oh, yes, that there. Yeah. My first dog, yes, my first dog was actually a cat called, called, <laughs> called Tanky. Called Tanky. <laughs> I begged my father for a dog when I was eight years old, and he, he, he got, got me a cat. cat. But uh, anyway, wow. I eventually got this little dog called Trixie. <laughs> and she was a Cairn Terrier and she, she I wanted a German Shepherd but I ended up with a Cairn Terrier and I adored her and I, and I got her when I was about I suppose about 10 years old and she and I had a very very close relationship hmm. and I was away when I was 18 I, I, I decided to go and study yes. for the priesthood and uh, so uh, yeah, I yes. did that I, off I went down to Kilkenny and uh, I had to leave Trixie behind, obviously. And uh, so one night I had this horrible dream that Trixie had been knocked down. I could see her being knocked down. I could see her being carried uh, to the vets. I could see her with uh, tubes coming out of her, uh, the whole monitor thing going, all that. And I woke up in a absolute bog of sweat. Uh, at about five in the morning, I ran down the stairs in the dormitories where we were in the in the seminary, and I rang me ma. I'm a, I'm from Cork originally, like him. My, I said, "Mom, what happened to Trixie?" And she says, "In the name of God, by why are you ringing me at this time in the morning? There's nothing wrong with her. What did you think? There's anything wrong with her?" 
I said, Mom, I saw it all last night in my dream. Mm. I saw her being knocked down, everything. No, boy, she's grand. Are you sure? Yeah. And that was it. So a week later, my mate, Chris Craig, who's from Belfast, <coughs> who's had his appendix out, he landed back in the seminary, and I, he, and I said, oh, Chris, good to see you back. He says, before you go any further, how the hell did you know that Trixie had been knocked down? I said, she wasn't. I thought she was. And he said, no, she was. It was exactly as you described it. And she was in the vets, and she was on the Ormo Road in the vets. How did you know that? I didn't know what I dreamt at all, my master. No, he said, it was exactly as you saw it. Now, how do you explain that? But that was the that was the relationship that I had with that little dog. Mm. You know, she was astonishing. Like, mm. I had another one. Sorry, so sorry. Huh? There's a lot. <laughs> There's an awful lot there in what you just said. <laughs> yeah. it, it really was. The and story that you shared at the start. Hmm? Yeah. Go on, sir. Just what you were saying, the, the question you asked about the connection between man and dog. I think that's yeah, and then and then recently, my little dog Fern, who was eighteen mm. and a half, I had to get her put to sleep, and it broke my heart. Is she really. gone? It was yeah, it was awful. But Fern, when she came to me, was going to be put down by the guy who had her before me because he couldn't mm. get her to come back. Mm-hmm. And I fell in over there. She was only eight months old, little black and white sprocker, mm. uh, cocker spaniel, uh, Springer cross. And I said, "There's no way you're doing that to her. I'm taking her home." And within a week, within two weeks, I had her coming back to me. Mm-hmm. So she was trained to find bodies. Mm-hmm. And her first task, so she she was trained to find bodies whilst working on a boat. So when people are drowning, the scent comes to the surface, and I trained her to find that scent, you see. And the very first task she had was two kids in Castlewell and Lake, Claire Steele and Rory McLinden. And the two kids had a tragic accident in the lake whilst in the canoe, and thing turned over and they were lost. Anyway, Fern had them found in, in 10 minutes. Anyway, in her last year, she took two strokes and she was incontinent, she was blind and she was deaf. And I nursed her for a year, right? Washed her wee bum every day, two or three times a day, all, all that. Came to the part where the vet said to me, look, Neil, you'll have to put her to sleep. It's not fair to her. She's in pain now. Mm. So I got her put to sleep and Two days after I did that, I, w- I was broken hearted, absolutely. And uh, I went into this wee coffee shop in Castle Wall that they know me. I came out of Mass and I went in there. And the girl says, Ah, oh, Neil, how are you? I saw on Facebook about wee fern. And I couldn't talk to them. I said, Look, I'll, have, I'll come back in. I went back out, sat in my car with the keys in my pocket, thinking about fern, the tears run down my face. And all of a sudden, the four windows in my two doors, front and back door, all dropped with a big bang into the door and the sunroof banged open. A sh- two big bangs. I thought, what the hell was that? So the windows are all open, the sunroof is open and all of a sudden I thought, that's the wee woman telling me, it's okay, let me go. Mm. And that was it. Wow. I immediately felt better for that. Mm. Now, how my granddaughter <coughs> said, ah, she says, you press your keys accidentally, and that's what happens when you do that. Even if it, the keys were in my pocket, I know I didn't touch them, mm-hmm. but even if I did, why then, when I was totally distraught, mm-hmm. did that happen? Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you have a spiritual upbringing? Uh, when my mother, I'm a Catholic, I was brought up as Catholic, my mother was very devout. Yeah. And we're, when we were kids, we, I okay, started off in Cork, but then my dad was in the Royal Navy, so we ended up in Cornwall, living in the way out in the wilds of Bodmin Moor, and we couldn't go to Mass or anything like that, so my mother would make us say our prayers and I'll do all this here on a Sunday and all, but that was the height of it. Mm-hmm. You know, they weren't, they weren't, we weren't fanatics or anything like that. And In fact, when I came to Northern Ireland first, I would have been nine years old, I think, eight or nine years old, Somebody in the street said to me, what sort of an accident have you got? <laughs> and I had a cork accident, and so that didn't go down well. And then they said to me, what are you? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? I'm a boy, what do you mean? <laughs> and, you know, oh, don't be funny with me, mate, and all this. I right. went into my man. I said, Mum, what am I? And she said, well, who asked you that? So we fell out there. And she said, well, I suppose 
you're a boy. That's all you need to know. And she says, um, I suppose they're asking you what religion you are. She says, and I never heard of Catholic before. Yeah. So I, she said, you're a Catholic. And that, that was my in, introduction to Northern Ireland. To the difference, yeah. I had never heard of it before. What so, was your... Go ahead. I was going to say, so wh- what point did you decide seminary? <laughs> What made you? Uh, when I was about twelve, I suppose I I thought to myself I was used to serve in the altar and that you know and I wouldn't be religious or anything like that, mm. but I just had this strong feeling that I needed to go and stru- uh, study for the priesthood. Wow! But I also had the strong feeling I wanted to go to sea, mm. uh, like my dad right. and my granddad, and my great grandfather, and ah. all that. So I ended up going to. Uh, so I passed me uh, eleven plus at the time. Mm-hmm. And I had a choice then of going to St. Malachy's College in Belfast or wherever I wanted. So I decided to go to Carrick Tech. I right. wanted to go to Carrick Tech and uh, do engineering, and I was going to go to C. And I went. I ended up in uh, at Glasgow at Stowe College of Engineering, do, uh, living in a tenement place in, in Stowe College. And uh, it, it was on Socky Hall Street or just off it. What's a tenement? Huh? What's a tenement? A tenement, like multi freaking floor building, gotcha. like there's about ten floors and bloody Flat, things, flats and, and all these flats rates, and yeah. things. It was re- it was an awful place. It was freezing cold at night, <coughs> and the, the the landlady was as hard as nails. Like you know, and two guys fell out one night in this place, and 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 one murdered the other. And there were four of us students at Stowe College, and we all lay, we all shared a double bed, two at the top and two at the bottom. <sighs> Jeepers. And we used to go four, out and, and <coughs> four people in the bed. Four people in the bed, aye. <laughs> and we used to go out and, into her kitchen at night and uh, secretly cook up meals because we were starving. <laughs> oh, man. Until one night, one of the guys decided he was going to have a fry and he pulled out the pan and all the saucepans fell on the floor with a big crash. <laughs> and then we heard her shouting, Who's out in my kitchen? <laughs> and we charged off into the bed, all pretended to be fast asleep, <laughs> snoring away. She burst in, I know it was you, you wee shit. <laughs> and, uh, all this <laughs> and we were trying our best to stay asleep. And that was my first experience of go to sea. I went home again. Then I joined. Then I decided after that, I'm going to go and study for the priesthood. Right. But that only lasted about three years, and I thought, no, it's not for me. Yeah. So I came home again, got a job in the dough spinning company as a g- translating German stuff, and uh, not very well either. And then <laughs> I decided this is sick in my ass, and, and I decided I'm going to apply to the Royal Navy. Wow. So I applied to become an officer and a gentleman in the Royal Navy. That was a three-day interview. There were like 2,000 applicants or something, and then they, they selected 100 out of that, and uh, I went to Dartmouth Royal Naval College then for a while. I was, so I stuck at Royal Navy for about two years. I just can't deal with all the the mindless kind of obeying orders and barking orders. I couldn't do that. Mm. I can't do that. I give you a simple example. One one of the exercises you had was when you'd be at sea, they would lower an eight oar. A rowing boat thing over the side of the ship and one cadet had to take charge of that they dropped you into the sea in the middle of the Baltic or wherever and they, you'd row around the ship you'd hook on to the davits and then they'd bring you back aboard again and they timed it to see who was the fastest and I took something like 45 seconds off the fastest time because I said to the guys wow. look I'm not going to be shouting at you, lads. You all know what to do. I just call the stroke. And that meant keep the oars in time. That's all that meant. Mm-hmm. And I got sent for when we came up by the training officer. And I thought, oh, I'm going to get a big pat in the head here for <laughs> this is good. And he brought me in and he says, what the f- am I? I'm not allowed to swear here, but he said, what the F was that? You're I allowed s- to swear. You can you swear. Yeah, 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 yeah. I said, what, what do you mean? He said, what the fuck was that about there? He said, I couldn't hear one order from you. What sort of an officer doesn't give orders to his men? I said, sir, I had told them what I wanted them to do. I kept the stroke. They did what I wanted. What more do you want? That's not the way the Royal Navy does it. (laughs) And I thought, that's it. Me and the Royal Navy will not go anywhere. Wow. So I'm just reflecting back to you here, right? You kind of went your mum's way. You went down the road of religion, and Mm -hmm. that didn't work out. And then you went your dad's way. 
and that didn't work out. Never thought of it like that, yeah. And that's really good because yeah. obviously yeah. our parents and the people that we're close to when we're young have such a big impact on us. Yeah. But there is that moment where you have to kind of figure out a third way. Yeah. Mm. And that's it's what it sounds like. That's what you were doing. Yeah, and I ended up then uh, going into teaching because I loved working with kids and I loved the whole idea of sharing things, you know, and then I applied to that and I got accepted to, uh, it was at that time, St. Joseph's Training College, it was called, it was part of, it's now part of Queen's, but, and, and I did science there and there were only six of us doing science that year and I got a job then in, in uh, St. Mark's down at Warren Point mm-hmm. uh, as a science teacher and then I ended up head of science down there and I taught there for 26 years. So, like, uh, I expected you to go straight into the dog world after all that. Uh, 26 years? Yeah, but dogs were always there. I mean, I was always working with dogs in my spare time. Always. I mean, the first dog I ever was bitten by was Pete, that I tell about in the story in the book there. Um, uh, and he hated everybody except his owners, and he hated me too until, oh, about going in there. So Peggy Martin was our neighbour, and that was another experience, a spiritual experience I had as well. She was um, my neighbour, and she she was lovely, Peggy and Kevin Martin, and they t- treated me like their son. And I was always, there were only three doors from where I lived, out in Rathcool. And uh, one day I was, anyway... Uh, Pete was this wee black and white sort of uh, Scotty and he was a real grumbly grumpy wee bugger he really was like and he hated me but I kept at him and at him and at him and then all of a sudden one day he just dropped the ball in front of me and let me play with him that was the first time ever now he wouldn't have anything to do with anyone and he and I became inseparable then we Pete Mm. wow Um, so like that was when I was about I still had Trixie at that time, so I was alternating between Pete and Trixie. Mm-hmm. But what happened was, uh, so I was then about, I suppose, about what I grew up there and I was maybe 17. I was working at a scooter, a wee motor scooter I had, repairing a clutch cable. And I was in Peggy's uh, gar- garage, because we didn't have a garage. And uh, I was working away at this, trying to get this clutch cable in this uh, Lambretta Starstream 125, <laughs> it was. And it was such a difficult job for me because I'm thick. And <laughs> and I, in the middle of all this, I heard my mother call me from across the gardens. Neil, she shouts. And I said, I'm coming, Mum, hold on a second. And I carried on working and I heard her shouting again, really loud this time. Mum, I'm coming, for God's sake, let me finish this. And then I carried on and then I heard her really shout at me. Ah, for fuck's sake, said I. And I threw the tools down Went into Peggy and he says, Peggy, mommy's called me down there. I don't know what she wants. I better go down and see what she wants. That's all right. So I go down the road, open the door, and my mask on ironing. And I says, Mom, what do you want? What's wrong? And she says, What's wrong with you, boy? And I said, You're after calling me there three times, you shouted at me. I never called you, she said. I didn't say a word to you. And with that, the phone rang. And my dad went and answered the phone. And he came in, his face white, and he says, that's the royal, the royal Victoria. He says, um, so my sister Cynthia was having a baby, and apparently she was at death's door. The mm-hmm. baby was um, spina bifida, and uh, she w- had to be uh, given an emergency caesarean, and she was at death's door, and the child was about to die. And they said, they need us up there right away. And I thought, wow. shit, that's what that was about. It's not strange. Well, it's very yeah. strange. Mm. And it's interesting that a few of those experiences now that you shared have been to put you in the right moment during a crisis. Mm. So it's interesting mm. that that's where you ended up being a lot of your life. How did you get into it professionally as such then? Into the dog world? You, I don't know. Do you want to talk about no, pe- Pepper um, or where, what's the best place to start well, with that? Well, see, I was, I was in the mountain rescue team, the Moor Mountain Rescue Team. I joined it when I was 73 or 4. And it was very small, made up of local climbers, guys like me who were doing rock climbing all the time and, and shepherds and that. And we were searching this night for this guy. What a crew. And rock climbers and shepherds. Yeah. and, and, and So biblical and, and, and hipster <laughs> at the same time. It's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> battered away, battered away through this 
freaking <laughs> muck and gutters and stuff uh, looking for this wee man who's gone missing. And I remember thinking, I'm sure I could train a dog to do this. Hmm. It must be easier. There must be an easier way to do So I decided that's what I was going to do. And I went and I spoke to the team leader at the time. He was Teddy Hawkins, a very grumpy, <laughs> hard-to-know guy, like a brilliant mountaineer, brilliant mountaineer, but didn't suffer fools lately. Like he really, and a very, very good team leader. I went and knocked timorously at his door one evening, and he says, he opened and he says, yes. <laughs> and I said, hiya, Teddy. Um, listen, so I was thinking of training the dog to help us to search for missing people at night. Did you? Do you know anything about dogs? And I said, well, yeah. And I, I know a fair bit, didn't you, I suppose. And, and I didn't, I was stumbling. I really yeah. was struggling, like, because he's that sort of guy, and I felt really intimidated by him. <coughs> and he says, uh, well, how are you going to do it? And I said, well, I don't really know at this stage, but I'm going to have a go at it, if that's okay with you. That's all right. Bang. And he shut the door. And that was the start of it. That was your big initiation. That was my initiation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't give a toss. <laughs> Slam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the moment you were knighted by this grumpy old <laughs> yeah, kid. Yeah. Like <laughs> it was desperate, you know. And then I thought, right, I want a German Shepherd. That's the only dog I could think of. And I had a friend called in, in the cups called Joe Boyd. I don't know how I knew him from Newton Arts. Anyway, Joe said to me one day, oh, no, that's right. I said, to, I wrote to the police at the RUC at the time, which for me as a Catholic living in sort of a very nationalist area, mm was a very dangerous thing to do. But I thought, well, I'm doing it for the right reason. I'm not, I want to help people. Yeah, of course. Anyway, the cops were very kind and they said, well, we'll send you this guy called Joe Boyd. You can work every Saturday with him and he'll teach you the ropes. Wow, fair play. And that's what mm -hmm. they did. So I went down and worked with Joe and then he, he got me this German Shepherd eventually. He says, look, Neil, you have to come and see this guy here. He's called Kim. His nails are as long as my, finger na my fingers. He's been totally neglected. He's like a scarecrow. He's been brutalized by this guy, but he said, you're the man for him. So I went and saw Kim, fell in love with him, took him home, and I thought, I'll train you now to be the first mountain rescue dog in Ireland. And I started training him, hadn't a clue really. Joe was guiding me, and but it was all police-type training. Yeah. Finding somebody, and then the dog stands barking at them. I thought, mm. well, that'll do for now. And then, by chance, I heard Hamish McGuinness in Scotland, who's a great mountaineer in Scotland, he was the leader of the Glen Comet rescue team. Mm -hmm. Had trained two shepherds, Rangy and Tiki, to do avalanche work, uh, having seen what they were doing in Switzerland. And I wrote to him or, and I got a very nice response back. He invited me over to meet him. Wow. So I went to Glencoe. He lived in Balahoolish, just outside Glencoe. And we sat and had breakfast and he said to me, this is how you do I did it and blah, blah, blah. So <coughs> then I discovered that in Scotland, there was a group called the Search and Rescue Dog Association, so I got in touch with them. And then they invited me to come and sort of have a look at what they do, and eventually then they accepted me into their ranks. So I trained away at Kimmy and brought him over. They put him through an assessment in Glencoe, in an avalanche scene, and said he was excellent, passed him, and that was your first initiation. And then you have to come back a year later to the Cairngorms and do a more advanced uh, assessment which I did mm. and he, he sailed through that uh, and that was the start of it Wow! and that would be in, in the 70 do, do I remember wrongly from your book that the first few dogs you tried to train in such a way they couldn't do the tasks they no, wanted they, to have sheep eye or something no, what, wrong? What, what, because of what they wanted to have sheep eye yeah, some of them did have Kim did Kim did actually Kim at the did, start. Yeah, yeah. Uh, What's but sheep by? Sorry, Neil will not staring explain. at sheep, you know, and or chasing sheep. Mm -hmm. So d he explain and the I, test. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. he and I had a discussion, Kim and me, and I explained to him that you don't chase sheep, Kimmy, and if you do, <laughs> you know, your all, all over. Yeah. shit will fall upon your head from a great height. <laughs> and uh, he 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 was a quick learner. He was safe with sheep. He was all right. right. But you, when you do sort of training, you are made... Well, in Scotland, not, but in the Lake District. I moved to the Lake District then. I started uh, training my dogs there, going back and forth to the Lake District. Um, they had a different, slightly different way of doing things to the way they did in Scotland, but just as professional, you know, really, really good. But it's different, different sort of t techniques and stuff. Um, but they would put your dog through a sheep test, hmm. 
uh, with a local farmer. And if he thought your dog had what they call sheep eye, where his dog was focused on the sheep, you would be instantly failed. Mm. You know, and everybody dreaded that test. Mm. But uh, but Kim passed it. Because right. it's right at the end of all the training and assessments, yeah. isn't it? It's the last test, and it's like, what a waste of... It could be. You yeah. could, in those days, you could have wasted a year's training yeah, or two years' yeah. training. Because once the dog took off half a sheep, that was the end of it. Yeah. But he was good, you know, and Kim was good. But he had a very quick temper and I discovered right. he'd, he'd bitten two people before I got him I didn't mm, know that right but um, he his last uh, search operation he found the local GP who'd gone missing in the mornings for 12 hours and he was badly hypothermic and his, I knew his wife and his wife rang me and asked me to help find him and we went out in the mountains and, and Kim found him on the edge of a river, standing, looking into the river. You know, he, he was just swaying. He didn't know where he was. Mad, yeah. Now I remember he said, Doc, Doc, come away from the river. Come away. Fuck you. Who are you? He <laughs> says, and he knew me really well. And I said, look, look, you're good. Sit down here, will you? And uh, such a lot of abuse. But anyway, we got some glucose into him and then he was fine. But that was the start of a journey that has lasted 40 years. Wow. So that journey... There's a lot that's happened in there. Oh, I. And so for the purposes of today, we were just saying, we're just going to throw out a few different situations and ask you to share a story or two around each of them. Sure, yeah. So the first one we wanted to cover was Lockerbie. Mm. What was Lockerbie? Well, and you what see, did your dogs do? I was, was Pan Am, I've forgotten. The, 747. Huh? Seven, Pan Am 747. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. It was Clipper of the Sea. And uh, she had a bomb in it. Funny enough, when I was doing my PhD, Viva. Yeah, it was terrorist. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. 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 When when I was doing my PhD, Viva, the, the professor who was the lead said to me, Neil, would you ever share something with us about your experiences with dogs just to get you put you at ease Yeah. for your for your Viva? Uh, the Viva Voce, which is a, like a vocal exam that you put you through for two hours about your research. Anyway, I said, yeah, yeah, I could. Would it be the Lockerbie thing? Tell us about something that stands out in your mind from that. So the Lockerbie air crash was was the this Libyan guy had put a bomb on in, in Germany somewhere into this uh, uh, jumbo jet, which was timed to explode over Scotland, and it, in fact it exploded over Lockerbie, and every passenger, all the crew, and people on the ground were all killed. There was I know two hundred and seventy or three hundred. Yeah, it was that. Yeah, my goodness. Fatalities, uh, no one survived. Um, it happened just two days or three days before Christmas. And um, I had been seeing it on the, t- on the news and the TV and stuff. And I rang my guy, my mates over there and said, look, do you need a hand? So sort of search dog people were all there searching for people out in Kielder Forest and all the surrounding areas and all that. And uh, the guys invited me to come over. Um, so it was... Christmas Eve, I think. And I rang the police in Newcastle and said, look, I need to get to Lockerbie. How will I get there? Well, that's the big uh, uh, air disaster. Yeah, right away. We'll see what we can do. And they rang me back and they said, right, can you get up to Aldergrove within the next two hours? Um, We'll give you a police car escort. So they actually took me up in police car Mm. to Aldergrove and there was a helicopter there. And I arranged for two other uh, people... uh, from further north of here, Vicky and Cameron, um, they they came with me. They were two dog handlers as well. I have a fear of flying, it's the first thing. And the first thing the guy who was briefing us said, look, we're going to be flying over the RAC, so you have to put on immersion suits in case we ditch. And I thought, shit, what, what seriously? And then he said, right, okay, and there's nothing to worry about, I right? <laughs> so I'm getting this thing on me and <laughs> put us into the helicopter anyway, so give us, and then took off, and it was at night, I remember flying over. And uh, then when we arrived in Scotland, the guy, the pilot came on, and he said, right, there's Lockerbie dead ahead of us, you want us to fly you around the area to give you a sort of familiarization? Mm. Now I'm donging myself <laughs> because I can't deal with a cut finger and here I am going over to recover bodies yeah. and body parts. I remember saying to the good man above, look, this is what I meant to do. Yeah. You're going to have to help me here because I can't do this. And that was all right. We landed in Lockerbie 
and the guy who met us who was in charge said, right, lads, do you want a cup of tea or anything like that? Or do you want to get stuck in? And I said, no, we'll get stuck in to hell with. So he took us down to the site. So I went down to Sherwood Crescent, which was where the the fuselage had, had impacted. Um, and I met one of my mates from Wales there, a fellow called Roland Leyland, and he said, uh, right, so you've got Pepper with you? And I said, yeah, has he ever done any work with dead bodies? No, hasn't a clue. He said, well, you see that hedge over there? Mm. And I looked across where he was saying, and there were all these like ribbons blowing in the breeze. Take him over there, he says, that's all human remains. Take him over there, get him used to that, and see if he's happy with that, and then we'll go from there. So I taught Pepper, find it, son, and taught him that that's what I wanted him to find, mm. with a ball and all that. No bother, he switched on to it very quick, and then he says, right, if you make your way down to, just down there, he said, and he pointed about 100, 200 yards away to where the crater was, and he says, go down there and talk to one of the cops, and he'll tell you what he want, wants you to do. So I met this young policeman standing on the edge of the crater, and the smell of aviation fuel was horrendous, mm. really bad. Like. And I said, uh, right, says I, this is Pepper here. And I said, he's a uh, search dog. Where would you like me to start? And he's only a young lad. And he says, well, I don't know. He says, I suppose down there, indicating the crater, which is about 30 foot deep, and just mud, just an absolute shit fest of mud. It was horrendous. While he was telling me this, Pepper was digging at my feet, digging a hole, <laughs> frantically digging. I, what the hell's wrong with him? And I asked one of the guys for a fork. So I helped him and I dug away down and up comes this half a torso, mm. and a head, chest, everything, all completely plasticine, like it was just featureless. And the young policeman said, oh, Jesus, beside me, and then, I said, well, what are we going to do? Well, here's a bag. We'll get this person into the... And such dignity and respect that was shown with magic. I was telling the professor this, Queens, and I burst into tears. Mm -hmm. Couldn't talk. Oh, no. That was really part of it. That was part of it. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you the rest in a second. So anyway, so we get that per fella or person into this bag. Meanwhile, Pepper goes down between uh, two walls that had collapsed, and he came out with an arm in his mouth. You know, just the radius and the mm. ulna, just the bones and the hand and all that. And uh, I thought, fuck me. And that was the next thing. So we spent time in there, and I was telling the professor then at Queen. So we, we went out there, and we were searching Kilder Forest, and <coughs> Pepper came out of the forest at one point with a red high heel shoe in his mm. mouth. That's and right. I, he sat in front of me with this shoe, and I took it off him, and I, I stand there looking at it. I turned it over, and I saw it was a size six. I'll never forget that. Yeah. And I thought to myself, there's a young girl who's been wearing this. Yeah. You know, who was she? And what's her mum and dad going to think? Mm -hmm. And blah, blah, blah. And all this. And then I ended up getting really upset. Mm -hmm. And we Pepper jumped out, must to say, like, come on, Dad, let's carry on. Yeah. You're right, son. And I told the professor this at Queen's. This is all before my PhD viva. Mm -hmm. I ended up in floods of tears. I couldn't speak. Because of that red high heel yeah. shoe. Yeah. That personalized what I was doing. Up to then, it was totally impersonal. Yeah, I got the strength that I had asked for mm -hmm. to do what I was doing. I mean, Jesus, like it was just amazing what I was able to do. And we were finding, well, I won't go into the detail, but anyway, it went on for five days mm. and then we came home. And when I came home, my wife and aunt all, they had kept Christmas back for me, like so Christmas oh. dinner. And my sister-in-law was there, and I remember her saying to me, Neil, at one point, Neil, what was it like? And that was it. I had to walk out. I couldn't talk about mm -hmm. it, right? For three years, I was thinking I was going mad because I would blow up the slightest provocation. Mm -hmm. I was very emotional. I couldn't smell um, fumes from a central heating boiler because it reminded me of the Avgas cracked up and there was a song I had heard on the radio Softly As I Leave You Now it was a, um, a male voice choir I couldn't listen to that song without ending up floods of tears mm. and I thought fuck me I'm losing it I, and then I decided somebody asked me would you train as a counsellor 
And I said, why would I want to do that? Marriage guidance counselling, you'd be a right man for that. I fuck off. Like, what would I know about that? <laughs> <laughs> no, and t- but I, I said, okay. And I, I went away and I, I did this training as counsellor. And then an opportunity came to go to Queen's and do my math. Now, I'd already got my basic degree through in science and I, to go and do a master's at Queen's in counselling, guidance and counselling for, for youngsters. And so I did that three year part time. Or was it two years? Can't remember. A wonderful course. There were sixteen of us in the in the. So each year, eight the f- the top eight would move on, and the a new eight would come in. So there was always sixteen. Very secure, safe place. And the professor said to us one day. She she says um, she was Ruth Leach, a wonderful professor at Queens, and she said, uh, "I want you all, sh- and I'm not touchy feely." And I can't get into all this emotional stuff and all that. I want you all to imagine you're a tree. <laughs> and picture yourself now as a tree. And I want you to just put <coughs> your pencil on the paper and let your pencil express your subconscious mind and draw whatever it is you feel that you are. What a load of crap I'm thinking to myself. And I just said, Neil, I noticed you haven't done anything, she says. And I said, right, Ruth, I'm sorry. And I just put my pencil on the paper and it started to draw two trees, two fir trees, right? And the, w- they were on a hill. And the higher tree was intact. The lower tree was broken off at the top and was leaning against the other tree. And I hit it. And she says, I want somebody to volunteer to put their drawing up on the board and we can discuss it. And there was, I made sure mine was well hidden. Neil, can I see yours, she said. <laughs> and she pulled mine out from under the things and put it up on the board. Now, she says, could you like to explain that? Why were there two trees? I don't know, Ruth. She says, think, she says. Why are there two trees? For example, who's this? What's this here? And I says, well, I suppose that's me and that'll be my wife. Why is she higher than you? And I remember saying, genuinely saying, well, she's, a better person than me. What do you mean by that? Well, I rely on her for everything. And so that's a very nice. And she said, tell me, what traumatic experience did you have three years ago? She specified three years ago. Wow. And I thought, what? I don't know. What, <coughs> what, what, what? Something really traumatic in your life. And I said, well, I suppose it was the Lockerbie air crash because that was three years previous. She had measured the tree somewhere. Well, it's a technique that you use. Greg Firth is the guy who would have led this. It's called art therapy, and it's a way of unlocking the subconscious mind, basically. And she said, tell us about your experience in Lockerbie. And then I just unloaded it all mm. in the security of that group. Mm-hmm. And from then on, I was able to deal with some horrendous situations, like four earthquakes I've been at. I've been at a helicopter crash with body parts all over the place. And I was able to deal with it all. All thanks to that course in counselling and Ruth Leach. Mm. Wow. Deep breath. That's insane. I cheese. I mean, it just... And, you know, I I do dog training. I do dog behaviour work. So I just have this ability with dogs. I think we're all given gifts of one sort or another. And I think I've been given this gift to work with dogs. I just mm. think that that's the case. And dogs, aggressive dogs, I can work with aggressive dogs and they'll come over to me and they do the usual sort of snottering and slobbering and teeth and all that. And then before I know it, they're sitting beside me and they're, and they're okay. Yeah. M- most of them, like I have been bitten, but um, most of them are good. But I find when I'm dealing with difficult, really difficult, challenging dogs, very often I find I'm using my counselling skills. <laughs> People wow. are asking yeah. me, you know, well, it's, this has happened or that has happened and then it, it, I can use those skills. Yeah. And so it's what I said at the start, we, we're, we're meant to follow certain paths, mm. do you know? Mm. I, remember, I remember you saying, sorry to interrupt, buddy. Um, I remember you saying uh, years ago when I was talking to you, it was something like the, um, if you want a dog to do arson detection or you want a dog to do uh, cadaver, recovery it's not about just getting a dog and saying i'm going to train you it's finding out what the dog naturally 
wants to do because some yeah, dogs yeah. don't like caustic yeah, smells. Yeah, there's a lot of truth in that, yeah. Um, and you're saying it's, it's that, we'll get on to epilepsy But that's, soon, that's in the professional side of dog training, you know, but like I, I, I deal with dog behavior issues where, where we yes. dogs are just being knobs. <laughs> you know, and there's there's it's a two-hour session usually but inevitably you will find when you talk to the people and you're watching the dog and i can see up to now thank god i've been able to see where the issues are and give them a wee strategy for yeah. for making them better yeah and, and i just love doing that so, so I've, I've got it now we're trying to figure out what title he has it's canine counseling yeah, there it is. <laughs> it's made in America. You could become a millionaire You're with a title like yeah. that. A canine counselor. <laughs> yeah. You can go to like all the rich Beverly Hills people and like train their chihuahuas. <laughs> all the chihuahuas. For them. <laughs> all the handbag you know, chihuahuas. Yeah, look, I was doing like, I could be doing it sort of five days a week, three times a day. Mm-hmm. I'm not interested. I do three yeah. days a week. I, I do it like I'll do one a day. Yeah. Mm. And I genuinely think, you know, that that's the need at the minute, but I'm getting too old. Did you meet your boy? Caesar. Yeah, I met Caesar. him twice. Caesar, Caesar Milan. Milan. Caesar Milan. Yeah, he, what was he, this show? I remember that. I, was, I watched that as a boy. It was the Dog Whisperer. The kind Dog of Whisperer. Yeah, that's yeah, what yeah, it was. Yeah. Caesar's was very talented. You know, he, he, well, there's two schools of thought about Caesar that he's brutal in, in the way he deals with dogs. Um, I do know he, he would use techniques maybe that would be frowned on, but I see what he does with dogs and I've met him. He's a very gentle, very nice man. And he's gifted with really difficult, difficult dogs. Dogs that are going to be put to sleep mm. because they're so aggressive, he will get round. But the other school of thought is that uh, he, he is brutal and people don't like him. There were two papers written on him. But I personally have a lot of time for Caesar Milan. Yeah. So there's a long list here and time is escaping us. You mentioned the earthquakes, the underwater detection you did you mentioned before about the scent rising to the top of the, the water, which I think is interesting. Pirated DVDs. Can you give me a, a wee bit yeah. on that? Well, the Motion Picture Association of America are a group which oversees or tries to protect the rights of MGM and Pathy mm-hmm. News and all the Disney and all this from piracy. So uh, as soon as a new film comes out, within, within 24 hours, virtually, it'll be pirated in those days. Um, and the hub for that was Malaysia at that time. And the head of the Motion Picture Association of America wanted to know if it was possible to train two dogs to detect hidden DVDs. So they asked another great dog a trainer a friend of mine, um, could, uh, is this D- Davy Mabry, who worked for, for the Motion Picture Association over here, he would sort of go into pubs and stuff and make sure that their licensing, um, they were complying with all the licensing laws and all that, overshown movies and stuff. And Joe asked me, or Davey asked me, was it possible? Would you be interested in trying this? So I thought, well, why not have a go? And I happened to be working with this character. I, I won't name the character, but anyway, he, he breeds dogs and uh, he, he was asking me to teach him how to train dogs to find stuff. So I said, look, You've got a couple of Labradors there that are not being used for anything, but I think they've got great potential as such dogs. Let's work with these, and I'll teach you as I go along. And what we'll do is see if there's an odour that's detectable to the dogs from optical discs, which are DVDs. So I used various techniques to find that, and then I eventually was able to hide these DVDs in cupboards, drawers, whatever, and the dogs were finding them and indicating. And the way they would indicate that to find them, would, they would just sit there and point with their noses at the source of the odour. And I rang uh, Davy Mabry up and I said, Davy, there's definitely an odour off DVDs and we've cracked it. And he says, how do you know there's an odour off DVDs? <coughs> and I said, because every time I hide them, no matter where I hide them, whether it's one or a thousand, the dogs find them. Wow. Ah, but he says... How do you know it's the DVDs? Well, what else is it going to friggin' be? And he said, well, it could be the labels that stuck onto the DVDs. Mm, the glue, could yeah. be the packaging, the yeah. glue, whatever. You need to get better results than that. So I went back to the drawing board. Anyway, the long and short of it was, I found there is an order of optical disc. It's polycarbonate. So the Motion Picture Association head man decided he'd come to London to test these two yogs that I had trained. There was him, his deputy, 
uh, a man called Glicks, Glickman and uh, there was two guys from the Customs and Excise and a film crew and they brought me to Stansted Airport and they said there's a plane that's just landed from Malaysia here's the cargo coming off it on this conveyor belt see if you can find DVDs <laughs> hundreds of packages and boxes so I put Lucky, Lucky and Flo with the two dogs and I put Lucky up onto the uh, uh, the conveyor belt she'd never been on a conveyor belt in her life so she's trying to keep pace you know just walking on the conveyor belt checking these boxes they were passing her she nailed one I lifted it off nailed another one lifted it off lifted her off and then the customs guy says right well, let's see what how good she is so he opened the first box up and there was all these tins and I looked at these tins and he says sorry mate he says tins of dog food she's finding dog food and I said are you sure about that check so he lifted out all the tins and there at the bottom was one DVD. Now it was a, a genuine <laughs> wow. marketing DVD, but it was it was a DVD nonetheless. For the dog food, like a marketing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So then he says, well, we'll open the second box. And he wow. opened the second box and it was a much bigger box. And it was full of counterfeit um, trainers, right? But when he lifted all the trainers out, there was another layer. And here was hundreds of uh, child pornography stuff, Jeez. all in DVD form. And they were blown away. And I, as a teacher, was, and I, I was responsible then as well in the school. One of my jobs was if a child was had been abused or sexually abused or, or physically or whatever, or there was a suspicion of that, it was my job then to liaise with the child protection team in Newry um, and see that the child was safeguarded, you see. So I had a particular interest in preventing mm, this going around yeah. the world, this horrible <coughs> stuff going around the world on DVDs. So anyway, that was that. So... They were blown away, and then they invited me then to go to. So I was flown around the world. I was flown to uh, Washington, New York, Los Angeles, Toronto, Dubai, Hong Kong, and all of these places where I was demonstrating the two dogs. Mm -hmm. They ended up then, uh, all the different customs and excise people were totally blown away by this. So they ended up being taken to Malaysia. Uh, I wasn't able to go with them, so Davy went, and uh, I think they found within the first day two and a half million quids worth of hidden pirated DVDs <laughs> behind a false wall. Wow! And then there was a hit by the bad dudes on the two dogs That's of right. ten grand each to do away with them, yeah. and so the two of them had to be flown out there in an emergency. Then, so then I was I was allowed to train two more dogs. Asked to train two more dogs, Paddy and Manny. I trained them. They went to Malaysia, and within four weeks, Manny had been killed by the pirate, by the guys who were doing the piracy. Yeah. And the other wee dog, I don't know what happened to Manny. And I had been promised uh, I'd be able to keep Lucky and Flo whenever they retired. Uh, but that never happened, and I actually never knew what happened to them. Mm. There is, as a side note, um, a specific dog that I cannot mention. <laughs> Um, he was responsible for breaking a massive paedophile ring in America because of a USB flash drive that he found. Mm. That was that dog is linked to you as well, just so you know. So there's a uh, big legacy that you you're talking about how much it means to you. On, yeah, it's on your heart. That's, that's, stuff, that's wonderful. There's another that, yeah. great Magical. story that you have been a part of. Since then, like uh, you know, if you if you go onto Wikipedia or something and you you put in Lucky and Flo, you'll see that this guy in England apparently was the first in the world to have trained this dog, this type of dog. People do that, you know. If you get an idea. Like, I've had so many people have come to me in my life and said, would you teach me how to do this or do that? And I would share anything with anyone. And all of a sudden, before yeah. you know it, they're the experts and you're thrown to one side, you know. And that, That's happened to you a lot, Neil. It's, yes, it has. So it's that was been one very of my hurtful. hearts for wanting to tell your story originally was because that's happened a lot to you. And it really sucks. Yeah, you get screwed. People, yeah. if, you're, if you're willing to be friendly and share things, people, yes. there are people out, not all, but there are people out there who will see that as a weakness and as a way to get a leg up yeah. at your expense. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's just human nature. Folks. Kind of, um, you can stay on that topic or you can take us somewhere else. One of the questions I love asking people is, what has been your most important failure? Failure? Yeah. Mm. Uh, I, that would be, a, I don't really, I think, I can't really answer that because all, I don't see anything that I've done as a failure. Love that. 
really, I genuinely don't. I, you know, where I have tried the priesthood and it didn't work out, I learned from that. You know, mm. I benefited an awful lot. Uh, I remember, like, when, when I came out of the seminary, the first time I had a job as a lifeguard down in Butlins, and I used to go every morning to the chapel, six o'clock, whatever it was, and I'd say a few pairs, and then I'd go down to work. And this day I went there as usual, and then I headed off down to work, and I got this overwhelming feeling that I needed to go back. And I went back to the chapel again, and I just knelt down, I was looking at the tabernacle, and and all of a sudden, I felt a strange feeling coming over the top of my head, like tingling. I went right through my body, and I just felt totally ecstatic, total sense of absolute ecstasy. And then, just as soon as that, it drained away again. <laughs> and I was just looking at that tabernacle thing. And I walked out down the camp thinking, what the hell was that? With? <laughs> what was that about? And that was that was over 40 years ago. You could have said I was a failure because I came out of the priesthood, but it wasn't. I think, on reflection, leaving the Royal Navy probably was mm. because I was bullied, severely bullied by this senior officer. Even it, So I'd, you go to sea, you, you'd learn all the basic navigation, then you come back and you do some short time back at the college. And he used to pick me out every Sunday morning when you do parade where you, you parade there in your best uniform and the guys knew he was picking on me mm. and they would go over my uniform with sellotape make sure there wasn't a mark on it and this guy used to pull me and one day he, he was so abusive uh, I fainted <coughs> and I was brought up before the, uh, the uh, commanding officer of Dartmouth and told that I lacked what, what was the what was the Moral fiber, uh, you are LMF, lacking in moral, moral fiber, and I decided that was it, I'm off, and the Navy decided it was uh, it was it as well, and that really stung me more than anything. That yeah. would have been my, even though when we were going across the Bay of Biscay in, in, a, in a Force Twelve storm, huge mountainous seas, and the officer of the watch said I need a volunteer to go up to the bow to shut a hatch. Where these hatches, where the it's an air intake, mm -hmm. the seas are pouring down the hatch and into the forward mast decks. Could somebody volunteer to go up and do that? Uh, this was at night, and I and he said, "Paddy, you'll do." And he pulled me out, <coughs> and no life jacket, Paddy. no Paddy. safety <laughs> line, nothing. Right? Yeah. He says, "Tell me when you're ready." He says, "And I'll slow the ship down." And I had to go down this ladder, in underneath the gun turret, and wait for the seas to break over me. Mm. And then run to the first breakwater and then the second breakwater until I got it right to the bow of the ship, shut the hatch, and then back again. Even though I was able yeah. to do that, yeah. you were considered not to have moral fiber enough to be a Royal Naval Officer. And I thought that was the biggest failure. Yeah, yeah. definitely. That, that's, that's a lie, first of all. You're one of the most... Mor full of moral fiber people I know. How do you wait for is that? Moralistically fiber. Full? HMF, high moral fiber. Eight, your HMF. <laughs> that, that's, that must have been. Yeah, that's the answer to your question. Yeah. yeah, that, yeah. That, that must have been a real kick for you in, in the manhood pants as well because that's a huge authority figure mm. in your life. I, speaking it, it that was, over it you. Was, it was really hard to take. Even I sort of feel sorry about that, you know, and, and, and I think it was unjust. Yeah. Totally. And yeah. I didn't get any support. Nowadays things are much better, but in those days you got no support at all. Yeah, you know. But I'm I'm glad I, it sounds like it's your most important because, you know, the impact you've had is astronomical, mm -hmm. and through the dogs, mm -hmm. through the work you've done there, you mm -hmm. probably wouldn't have got onto that if it wasn't you for them. Pushed out. yourself harder because of that, maybe, mm -hmm. to prove yourself or something. Well, yeah, yeah. See, one of the things that we used to do with the dogs was the, in the old days, the dogs stood and barked mm. at the casually whenever they found him. And I, I reckon that this is silly because I couldn't hear my dog because he'd be half a mile from me mm. and the wind howling and all that. And I remember saying to the guys in, in Scotland who were then, I was working with them, saying to the training officer there, Bill Meekie, I said, Look, Bill, I can, I'm sure I could train this dog to come back, bark at me, and then take me to the person mm -hmm. no it's impossible and straight away when somebody says it's impossible I thought <laughs> I'm going to do this and yeah. I did do it yeah. and I demonstrated it 
and it's now that's the technique that's that the they technique. use all over the world now. you invented that yeah, yeah. I love that um, well I'm not saying I'm the only one there could have been somebody else somewhere else in the oh, world I hear yeah, yeah yeah but I don't know of anybody at the time yeah. who was doing that you know but. tell me r- remind me of this fantastic story about the guy um, you all went looking for this guy and and he, he yeah the, the funniest story <laughs> tell tell that story I'd tramping love that story. around the mountains at night searching for this guy for for like three hours yeah and the, this is before I had the dogs <laughs> and it was pissing rain and you know, covered in gutters and falling flat in your face and all and uh, the guy's name was we'll say Michael O'Shea for the sake of argument <laughs> and he was thirty six very specific tramping along and <laughs> and then we all decided to take a break and then uh, somebody noticed this guy was with us that wasn't a member of the team and somebody said how you doing boy where'd you come from I says I thought I'd give you a hand here I see you're searching for somebody I, and what's your name Michael O'Shea for fuck's sake <laughs> this is the guy we've been looking <laughs> for, for for three or four hours in the pigeon rain helping us to look for himself <laughs> I love that <laughs> Secret heart of God. that's one of my favourite stories from your, from your that's genuine your book. that's good um, okay so I'm going to push into that kind of the, the the main topic that's on my heart about um just you know manhood masculinity that kind of stuff i just want to ask you when is it that boys become men is it a moment is it a period of growth is, what do you think what do you remember the moment when you first felt like i'm a man i suppose the first time i really knew it was when my dad said to me one time you know your sister's in the hospital having a baby and you are right there. I had a job working at the Europa Hotel, driving people around uh, at night. I was a, a night porter, um, and I had just come home from a night shift at 2 in the morning or something like that to be confronted with my dad, giving out to me because I hadn't paid enough attention to my sister who was in the hospital. That was the time I was telling you about. And I had just been shot at that night. Uh, two guys in West Belfast tried to take the van off me, and... I remember the bullets sparking off the road as I was Sorry. driving down the road. And then I <laughs> nearly hit by one of these big armoured car things, the big pigs they call the them. pigs, yeah. And I remember losing my temper. My dad losing my temper, his temper with me and grabbing me by the throat. And I remember drawing my fist back and said, don't you ever hit me again or threaten me again. And my poor mother distraught. And I thought, Jesus, this is not the way to be. This is not the way to be. It was all the stress and all the rest of it that caused that. Is that being a man? I don't know. It, it was standing up for myself. Yes, that was it. Yeah, that was the first time I really stood up for myself. I said, I think I said the same thing, wasn't it? The first time I stood up for myself. Yeah, and it was to your dad as well. Yeah. What I like about that story is it was the the holding back of the punch. Yeah. 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 Oh, I would never hit my dad. No. Ever. Ever. No matter what he had done. There's the something really. Like abhorrent about that hitting your parent thing. Oh yeah, I couldn't that, do it because I remember feeling that too. I remember saying to you like I felt shame mm-hmm. in the moment. Of I, and I still feel shame. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I was I used to do a lot of judo in my day, and I mm-hmm. fought for the navy and as a judo player. Yeah. And <laughs> what guy did you bring in today? <laughs> this guy is unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I I knew I knew I could have really hurt my dad if I'd wanted to, yeah. and I had no intention of ever doing that to yeah. my dad. And I loved him dearly underneath it all, you know, but he yeah. was a hard man. You, uh, you're maybe a good man to ask this question to. I was having a really interesting conversation with a friend over the weekend. We were out for a hike and we were discussing what does it mean to honour your father and mother? Mm. Mm. You were almost a priest. Can you have a stab at it? I, I'd honour my father. And my, well, I always showed my mum and dad respect. Always, always. Whatever they asked me to do, I would do it. If I didn't want to do it, I would try to get out of it but I always asked him but daddy was very hard with his hands like you, if you stepped out of line you got some walloping but I would never disrespect my mum and dad ever mm. you know my mother did everything for me so my dad like he brought me to, when I wanted to go to the sea he brought me over to Glasgow and he stayed with me there for two or three days and whatever I wanted to do they supported me whether it was to go to the sea or be the priest or whatever they always supported me and Daddy left me in this uh, YMCA place uh, till I could get somewhere to stay. And there was this man he met there, and he said, "Look, I have to go back home to Ireland." He said, "Would would you keep your eye on Arneil and make sure he's okay?" And oh, certainly I'll do that. And 
the following night, knock on the door. This man was there, it was like one in the morning, and I was writing a letter to my ma and dad. I was sitting in my bed, and he brought, he came in, and he, he sat on the edge of bed, and he turned out to be uh, a paedophile. Uh, yeah. And uh, I was only, what, 17? Something like that. And uh, I remember him trying to force himself on me. And I had a glass of water on the side of my bed, and I grabbed the glass, and I said, you come anywhere closer to me now, and I'm going to bury this into your face. You can't threaten me like that. He said, I'm going to make a complaint. And if you complain to the management, he said, it's your word against mine, and I've been here for five years. Who do you think they're going to believe? Jeepers. That was my introduction to the real world. Mm. And I thought, what a betrayal. What a betrayal. <sighs> do you know? Yeah, the darkness of the world, yeah. There is so much to talk about. <laughs> I think it's really interesting and I think it's really important that you had strength. What I mean by that is you knew you could defend yourself. Yeah. You knew you could mm. fight back, whether it was to your dad or to this man. And, mm. you know, obviously with your dad, you had that beautiful sparing moment, mm. which I think was right for you to do. Mm. I think so many young guys, so many men in general, no matter how old they are, they don't have that physical confidence mm. and I think mm -hmm. that's something that we're missing mm -hmm. where do they get that from is the question mm. I don't know with me it was martial arts like doing judo I used to go to mm. Shankill Road I think it was there was a judo club there and uh, I loved it I absolutely loved doing judo playing judo mm -hmm. I was never brilliant at it like, but I really enjoyed it <coughs> But yeah. I knew enough. I knew that I could defend myself mm. if I had to. Yeah, yeah. I, I, similarly, I, I didn't have that physical confidence when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So I started doing martial arts about eleven-ish jujitsu. Jujitsu is yeah. brilliant in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, remind me of this. Is there something? To, did I once remember you telling me there's a statue related to you, your family, or something in Cork, and yes, I went and got a picture. Cove. I'm from Cove. Cove, originally, yeah. Yes, I got my a picture. Yeah, my uncle Frank was a, he was in the Harbour Protection Group. Uh, he was like ships during the war. And mm -hmm. uh, he would also go out with a pilot launch to put the pilot on the ships coming in and out of Cork Harbour. Yeah. And this night, the one of the Irish shipping line, I think it was the Irish Elm. Yeah, she was going out, she was going out to sea. And they went out to put the take the pilot off, and uh, normally the ship would slow down. Uh, we, we, well, they obviously slowed down to transfer the pilot, but they would remain at the sort of a slow speed until the pilot launch got clear. Mm -hmm. But this night, for whatever reason, they didn't, and they steamed ahead. And my uncle and the three crewmen were were pulled underneath the propeller, and and Jeez. they were all killed. Yeah. Uh, so there's a statue yeah. in Cove to his memory. Frank, yeah. Frank Powell. Because I remember texting you and saying, I found the statue. I got a picture ah, of it. Yes, we were there. Right. My brother and sister live, um, brother, sister, brother and sister-in-law live down there <laughs> in, uh, in Cork. In, uh, and we went out for a meal in Cove. Yeah. And uh, wow. I, rem I remember going, I think I'm in Cove. I think this is where Neil's from. And I think that's the statue he mentioned. <laughs> I got are. a picture. Good and find, it, to yeah. You. Yeah. Um, Good it was a lovely yeah, moment. Neil, starting to land the plane couple more questions then we're out of here right if you could bring back one of your dogs mm. which one would you bring back oh god uh, I couldn't answer that okay no. sorry don't, uh, don't just, want to put you in that position no, <laughs> no. They, were all, they were all every single one of them was, was wonderful every single one yeah. of them mm. yeah I, I like how I, you talk about them I can't yeah. think you know I, I they're like little characters that are still around me, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I really do believe. I, I like I like d dogs are to me are just pure love, you know, unconditional love. Mm -hmm. And if you accept that there is a God of love, I think that they are. They're all. They all take a bit of that love, that that massive love bubble that's in the sky, whatever it is. And I think love never dies. You know, it's always there. It'll, it'll go back to love. We'll go back to love, kind of thing. <laughs> and I think the dogs are always there, you know. And they've been wonderful. Every single one of them has been w wonderful little character. Mm. One of the biggest regrets in my life is that my granddad died 
when I was young. He died. I was maybe four, maybe five. But he was a dog breeder, mm. and he was a he was a hunting man. And I'm a real soft city boy, like. Yeah. And he was out shooting, and you know, like winning clay pigeon competitions and all this sort of stuff. I found a, I don't know if it was a plaque or a trophy or something from Hugh, and he had won a competition and it was like 99 out of 100 clay pigeons. Oh, wow. so, what type of a monster was this guy? <laughs> you know, tough guy, would have fought with people, had a motorbike and all this sort of stuff. But I think, you know, it would have been interesting to see how my life would have turned out differently if he was still there. Hmm. I guarantee you I would be uh, a few more calluses on my hands probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we are who we are because of who we are. Do you know what I mean? We're, we're, you get steered. You get you scared by the people that you meet, mm-hmm. the people that you meet in your life, you know, as, uh, casually. Yeah. Mm. Um, and the odd word here or there, like somebody smiled at me one day and I thought, well, what a nice thing to do, you know. Yeah. Mm. Uh, just thanking me for letting them cross the road or something like that. I thought, you know, that's nice. Yeah. If you could, could go back in time, say to, uh, I don't know, an 18 year old version of yourself to young Neil to yeah, young yeah, young yeah. Neil yeah and you had a few minutes of his time what sort of things would you say to him just do what you think you should do and don't be put off by anyone you know you seek advice yes ask people for advice hmm. but if you think you want to do something go and do it just go and do it I mean what am I doing a PhD at my time of life for and yet I thought I need to do this because I believe I owe it to people who have, well, in this case, epilepsy, to use the talents that I have working with dogs to be able to help those people in some way. Mm-hmm. And that's what drove me to do it and, and battered my way through five and a half years of real hard work at Queen's to mm-hmm. get, get my PhD at my time of life. It's amazing. You know, I don't, I, fuck it, I don't need to do that, but I just felt I have to do it. Yeah. And that's, that's what would have, motivated me through all those hours of sitting there 12 hours a day like you'd be doing mm. writing your stuff up and all that but and the epilepsy one explain that one to us again the, this was a dog uh, it's it's about the fact that dogs family pets are able to predict epileptic seizure onset or diabetic highs and lows or addison's disease which is a drop in cortisol or in some cases post-traumatic stress mm. disorder issues they can predict those Wow. And I was interested in that, and um, I did a survey, went around the world, do you have epilepsy? Yes. Do you have a pet dog that's untrained? Yes. Does he ever predict your seizures? Yes. How does he do it? Mm. He does it by staring at me, by touching me, or by barking at me. Uh, how long before a seizure would he do this? Anything from five minutes to an hour. Wow. Yeah. And I thought, right, that's it. So I have to find a way of proving whether this is true or not. Mm. So I've got 20 untrained dogs local dogs from Glen Craig Dog Training uh, Club, which is Michael McCartney in Lisburn. Um, 20 dogs from there. Nothing to do with epilepsy. And I had to find a way of delivering to the owners an odour that the dog would recognise as a as a seizure odour. Mm-hmm. So I developed this re- device, which is called a remote odour delivery mechanism. It doesn't really matter what. It's just a basic way of delivering odour. Um, so they would, an owner would sit in the middle of the laboratory and his dog would be allowed to wander around the laboratory at random. But unknown to the dog were two little pipes coming from another laboratory, one under one leg, one under the other leg. They would randomly pump out the odour of a seizure or the odour of a non-seizure, just sent from a person. As soon as the dog detected the odour of seizure, he reacted in the same way that these people around the world were telling me. Because I thought, well, if these are untrained dogs doing this naturally, surely if I take 20 untrained dogs, I'm bound to see the same behavior. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If I expose them to what they think is their owner about to have a seizure. And sure enough, that's what happened. So I was able to detect from that that, that, that epilepsy gives off an odor which the dogs will detect in a way that causes them to demand attention from their owners for some reason. Mm -hmm. That part, I don't know why. (laughs) But I also don't believe that it's epilepsy per se that has an odour. I think that any physiological condition like hypo or hyperglycemia, 
or epilepsy create um, a physiological stress odor mm -hmm. in the body which we breathe out mm -hmm. and that stress odor is what the dogs are reacting to. Mm -hmm. So my postdoctoral work is about proving that to be the case or trying to get evidence to support that view. So there's two types of seizure. There's epileptic seizure and there's psychogenic non-epileptic seizure. Both look the same, mm -hmm. but they're completely different um, basis. Um, and yet dogs are reacting to the same, in the same way to both types of seizure, which science up to now has dismissed. They've said, well, we're not interested in non-epileptic seizures and the way the dogs react to them because that's not epilepsy. That's nonsense to me. Why are the dogs doing it? Mm. Why? What is it about that type of seizure that evokes the same behavior? So that's what my research now is about. And I'm working with the neurology department at, um, in the Belfast Trust uh, to try to work out what that is. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Dr. John Craig and Michael Kinney are the two consultant neurologists there, and we're working together on this. Incredible. Exciting. Class. Really it is, cool. yeah. yeah. Search Dogs and Me, Neil Powell. The link to his website will be in the description wherever you're listening to or watching this. Young Neil, thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure, lads. Thank you. Really Good incredible. Uh, plug, plug her also for Sarda. Oh, the Search and Rescue Dog Association yeah. in Ireland North, yeah. It's a charity that trains dogs for yeah. missing people. Um, we train dogs to find people on the mountains, under the water, so the dog works from a boat to detect the underwater odour. Or a clap structure, we would work with the fire service. And we have two dogs trained to work with the fire service. They were at um, Creaselock recently as well, mm -hmm. searching mm -hmm. for people there. Amazing. Thanks, Si. Appreciate it. Thank you. For Thank, you. Good. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys.